We will be in the book of Matthew today, chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 12 verses. We're going to continue in the Christmas story, and I'm looking at it through the sermon series. I'm calling it When to Change. This will be the last week of this short sermon series. Uh, we'll be having a Christmas Eve service next week. Book of Matthew, chapter 2, first 12 verses. That will be an easy one to find. Mm -hmm. If you're there, say amen. Amen. All right, let's see what God's Word has to say to us this morning. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, <clears throat> saying, Where is he who had been born king of the Jews? For well, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judah, For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For, not, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. <laughs> then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. Wow. I, I tell you, there's a, there is a season for everything. I talked about it somewhat in the scriptures, uh, in the sermon last week. There is a season for everything. We often wonder why things don't always work out. You ever notice that? Yet at other times, things seem to fall into place. No matter what we do, you know, it seemed like we didn't do everything right, but it still fell into place. There's a season for everything. It's the only thing I can figure. There's a season for everything. You know, the older I get, the more I see that. We should not become frustrated from doing the right thing. Even when it seems like there's no, uh, no result to anything that we're doing. You know, I don't know about you, but I like to see results of what I've done, but sometimes that's just not the case. And as I've seen, there is a season for everything. So I can't become frustrated from doing the right thing just because I don't see results. Evidently, it wasn't the right time or whatever. God has a plan. At this point in the Scriptures, it was time for God to reveal Himself to the world, to all of mankind. And I praise God for that, because where would we be if God had not have done that? We'd be in trouble. The revealing of His Son, the birth of His Son, Jesus Christ, was a game changer. That was the wind of change that this world need, needed. It needed uh, Jesus Christ to come. Even though we know it to be a joyous time, it's not a joyous time for all. For some, it's a time of dread, actually, with the, with the birth of Jesus. With Jesus, it, it's not a good time. For anyone not in right relationship with God, the coming of Jesus will be anything but joyous. You see, we, we try to paint things up. We want to make everything sound so good and wonderful. But if you're not in right relationship with Jesus, I'm telling you, it's not going to be a great time. If we take a moment to think about it, God took the time to make himself known at a specific time and a specific place in history. Why? Why did he do that? Because God had a plan all along. All along from the very beginning. He knew exactly when Jesus would be born, where he would be born. He even knew our names before we would ever be born. He knew us, as the scripture says, while we were in our mother's womb. <clears throat> he had a plan all along. Even when we didn't. 
all of mankind and all of our knowledge and all of our uh, uh, planning. God had a plan all along. You see, that when the second coming of Jesus Christ, this marks a point in history when God was drawing all people and all nations to himself. And I did say all people and all nations, not just some. God came for all of us, not just some of us. He came for the best of us. He came for the worst of us. And it doesn't matter where you're at on this, in this world, God came for you. But what I find, and it, it is, but from what I find, God can, and He usually does, speak through people in their own culture. He not only came for us here in America, sometimes we think <laughs> He just came for us here. He came for all nations and all tribes. He usually speaks to people through their own culture. Yes. Just like He did us. He just like He did us. By what I find is that by doing that, He did it in a way that we could understand it. What if he had spoke to me in another way from another culture? I would have had no idea what he was speaking into my life. I couldn't have understood that. He met us where we're at. He spoke into our life in a way that we can understand it. God is drawing and leading all people to him. Even if they don't want anything to do with him, he's still drawing and leading all people to him. We might not always see it. We might not always understand it. I'm, that's, that's me. But I do know this. God is always working. He's always working. Even when I don't understand. As I read the scriptures of the day, I believe that is what was happening here. God was drawing all men and all people to him. Look at the Magi that we just talked about that brought the gifts. There is, that's an example of God doing that, using people. The Magi mentioned in the scriptures here, these were not Hebrew men. They were not of that culture. He was drawing all nations and all people to him. As, as, a, uh, as a white American, I have to remember that Jesus was not a white man. He was not a black man. He was not a Hispanic man. He was a Jewish man. He was not, he was not my color. He just wasn't. And many times we think, you know what, Jesus is like me. You know, I, you know we want to make him, you know, as a white man, you know, we, we want to think that he had European lineage. He did not have European lineage. He just did not. He was a Jewish man, as I see from the scripture. That's not just something that I say. From my experience, I see many people try to make Jesus like them. They try to make Jesus the color they are. Whatever make, they like to make Jesus how they feel he should be. I'm telling you, you can't even change Jesus. Jesus is who he is. We try to make things important that are not important. Sometimes when me and my wife travel, one of the things, we don't do anything spectacular when we travel or something, but when we go through states, one of the things that I like to do is I like to go to flea markets. Anybody else like to go to flea markets? <laughs> that ain't nothing spectacular. I love to go to flea markets. You know, sometimes, you know, it don't have, I don't have to shoot off no missile to be happy to me. I like going in, you know, when you go to that flea market, what do you see? Anything and everything. And you know what I mean? You can see anything there. But I like going to flea markets. You know, a good flea market to me is a, 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 a one in my book. <laughs> I like that. But I always look around. Some of the, you know, you, you're probably just like me. Some of the vendors are you're drawn to and you'll stop and you'll run through this stuff. And there's other vendors you just kind of walk by and like, that's not really for me. You just keep walking, you know. <laughs> and, but as I look at some of the vendors, <laughs> sometimes you see some unusual things. I, I, I guess as a Christian, I, I look at things a little different. I always see a lot of, you know, some of the vendors have a lot of figurines. You know, some of them are little, and, you know, some of them are really big and different things. But what I see among the figurines, a lot of these vendors that I've seen at, uh, at flea markets and things, I see many different versions, and I see many different colors of Jesus. I think, I think every skin tone in, a, in the world is represented in some of these figurines that I've seen. When I, when I see these things, I don't know exactly which skin tone Jesus was. Does it matter? Not to me. We make the things, things important that are not. But as I see it, when people are trying to make Jesus to change the skin color and trying to make him, they're trying to make Jesus like them instead of us trying to be like him. See, we get it all mixed up. 
We're supposed to be like him. But we try to make him like us. We try to fit him in, you know. I think Jesus would have did that. It's probably something that you like to do. <clears throat> We've got to be more like him and stop trying to make him like us. We need to stop losing our focus and putting our attention on things that don't really matter. None of that really matters. I think one day as a believer, when you cross over to the other side and you meet Jesus face to face, I think you may be surprised what he looks like. Does it really matter? No, he's my Savior. That's all that matters. You know what? It doesn't really matter. Some of the things that we get focused on, we can just lose our, lose just everything. Get, uh, lost my train of thought here. We lose our focus on, put it on, put it on uh, little things that don't really matter in life. Let's look at the Magi just for a minute in the scriptures that we just talked about. God used a star to lead the Magi to the creator of the stars. I thought that was unique. But we shouldn't lose our focus on the stars, though. Many times we'll start, instead of, instead of thinking about the Creator, we think about all the other things. Instead of about the Magi being led by a star to the Creator of the stars, we put our attention on the stars. The way our world, the modern world, looks at the stars and the constellations nowadays is not how God ever intended it. Never intended that. Modern astrologers have twisted the way God intended us to look at the stars. They have twisted it. As a Christian, I should never participate in modern astrology and the reading of horoscopes. I should never participate in such things. Amen. should never participate in such things. I know that may upset a few, but it's, it's okay. It's good to get your blood pressure flowing early in the morning. It's all right. <laughs> It'll be okay. In the book of Psalms, chapter 19, the first six verses, I'm not going to read it to you, but I'd like to give you the reference so you know where I'm going with this. We see the works and the words of God. We see the purpose of creation. It is to declare the glory of God. Even the eloquence of nature will extend to the end of the world. The stars were placed in heaven as a sign to tell us a story. The stars in themselves contain no power in and of themselves. There's only one true power in this world, and that is God himself. We should always focus on the creator and not the creation. We start focusing on the creation, and we lose sight of everything. We must be careful not to be led astray by such things, because we'll start making the side things the main thing. Not that creation isn't important, but... It can never be the main thing. In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 16, it says something kind of unusual. It says, be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. I don't know about you, but in this world, that's kind of hard to do. Because what's the first thing that happens? As soon as somebody hurts us, we want to return the favor. <laughs> yeah, oh, you hurt me. I just put it this way. Thank God for God that he helps us to curb those kind of things. We need to make the main thing the main thing. Is really why I brought that out. Why was Jesus called Emmanuel? The names of Jesus Christ, they actually multiply because due to his divine nature and his miraculous work, there are many names for Jesus. To say that Jesus would be called Emmanuel means Jesus is God as he dwelled among us in his incarnation. He is always with us. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was making, Jesus was God making his dwelling among us as we see in the book of John chapter 1 verse 1 and book, book of John chapter 1 verse 14. God keeps his promises. That's hard to get anybody to keep a promise nowadays. Have you ever had, had anybody promise to show up and do some work at your home? <clears throat> they only never show up and never call and you never see them. It's hard to get people to keep their promises. I thank God that He is with us and we think this world is bad now. What if God had never decided to show up? What if God had never decided to reveal Himself? We think this world's bad now. What do you think it would look like without God? We'd be in trouble. Many times in life, all I've seen time and time again is that we just simply need to do the right thing even when we're tired. 
We just need to do what we're supposed to do. Many times we won't do that. We get tired. I've been doing it a long time. I see no results from it. We just need to continue to do what we're supposed to do in this life. I see time and time again God revealing himself to people all throughout the scriptures, all throughout my life. I see time and time again, time and time again God revealing himself to people that were just doing what they were supposed to do in life. Sometimes we want lightning to come down from heaven before we move. We just not to do what we're supposed to do many times. And I see God revealing himself time and time again. We can see that in the Christmas story. We see that in the scriptures we use today. Look at the Magi. They didn't bring lightning from heaven. But they ended up in the presence of God. They just did what they were supposed to do. That is all. They did what God called them to do. That is all. The Magi did what all seekers of Christ should do. As they worshipped, they were responding to Christ's love. How did they do that? We're going to touch on just briefly. I'm going to work through that real quick. What did the Magi do? They entered. In other words, they were seeking out God. They were seeking out Jesus. They entered. That's what the scripture said. They entered. They were seeking out God. Many times we're seeking out something else in life. Sometimes we're looking for something else. Unless you put God first and you're seeking out God first, the rest of it's not going to fall in place. Something else it said, it said they, they bowed. In other words, they showed reverence for God. You would think in the, even in the house of God, sometimes it's hard to find reverence for God. Thirdly, I've seen, they gave their best. You know, that's all God expects, right? That, that's all God expects is their best. That's all He expects. Fourthly, they worship. In other words, real authentic worship. When I, when I go to a worship service, I can really care less whether it's hymns or contemporary. That doesn't really bother me. But what I want to see is the people that are up leading worship, I want them to look like they at least believe what they're saying. Amen. You ever been in a worship service like they were taking medicine? I mean, I, I just want to see that, that, they, that at, least, at least act like you believe what you're saying. Have you ever looked through a congregation during a worship service? I'm like, wow, we're going to be worshiping the Lord. I don't even think they believe what they're saying. I want, I like to see real, authentic worship. That's just maybe that's just me. You know, the rest of it doesn't really matter to me. And lastly, but certainly not least, they responded. The Magi responded in obedience. How is that? They were told, they were revealed to go another way home from King Herod. They, weren't, they were told not to go back to King Herod to go home another way. They just simply did what they were told. They just went home. They didn't do anything, you know, terrific. They didn't wait for lightning to come from heaven. They just did what they were told. You see, many times we make it about things that it's not really. It's not always about all this other stuff. Many times, you know, we get so off track simply because we get so mixed up. The Magi just did what they were supposed to do. And I ask you, are you just simply doing what you're supposed to do in life? Are you doing what you're supposed to do in your relationship with God? I can't answer that. Are you doing what you're supposed to do? Or are you maybe you've gotten off track somehow? Time and time again, as I say, I see God revealing himself all through the scriptures. To people that were just doing what they were supposed to do. But we get tired of waiting. You know, when God reveals something to you, that does not mean it's going to happen right away, right? God's timing is a perfect, is perfect. There's a season for everything. Jump back to the Old Testament just briefly. Look at David, King David. When, when he found out that one day he would be king of Israel, it was probably 10 years or so before that ever happened. And his life was threatened many times along the way. He's probably wondering too. You know, you know, there's a season for everything, but God, you told me I would be king one day. We get tired of waiting on God. We wish we should never. If God has told you something, I'm telling you, there's a season for everything. Never, never grow tired of doing the right thing. Regardless of who the wise men were. There's a lot of people say they were this, they were that, they were astrologers, they were kings from somewhere else. Whoever they were. The wise men had to be of high standing. Why do I say that is? Because they had access 
to King Herod. Not and just anybody had access to King Herod. You know, for us to have access to high officials, usually, you have to have connections or something. You know, we just, you know, you just don't walk into the presence or, you know, what of a, a high official usually. That's not the way it usually works. I, I want to uh, share a story from my own life here. There's a reason I'm going to tell you this. I'm just not telling you something just to pass the time. Believe me, I'm going somewhere with this. You know, I don't like the sound of my voice that much. Some years back, I took a little side job as a security, doing security on the side, just to make a little extra money. And it's been a while back now. And um, I did it for like three years in a row. I did it at the uh, Delaware State Fair, I did security. Well, a lot of the people that apply for those jobs are not really the most responsible people, I just say that. You know. So as one of the as one of the older guys that applied, a more responsible one, they put me in another person in an area where it was more they needed some accountability, you know, make sure that it was the things that were going on there were done right. So they put me in another person back there. Um, they uh, the area they put me by during the fair it was like by the casinos. So I had to make sure the stuff that was coming in and out was not the way it was supposed to. It was actually quite busy, quite busy. And uh, we were checking everything. I, I think I'm telling you this for a reason. I'm going somewhere with this. But you wouldn't believe the nonsense that you would see, what people would try to do. And uh, they, had a, they have a day during the fair. Now, I don't know what the technical name is, but the people that actually work there during the fair, we would call it Politician's Day. That's what we call it. It was always the second Thursday. The, the politicians from the area and all the, all the high officials from the state and all that, they would come in. And I don't know if you, how much you know about the fair, but there's, that, there's one building back there by the grandstands. They have all the politician stuff every year. That's always in there, but the politicians are not always there. Well, I, you know, I had, well, they told me, they told us that day, they do it every year. The area that I was in, they would kind of funnel those politicians right into our area, right up there by us. That was kind of a staging area for them before they went out. They had to make sure their security guards and all that, where everything was in place before they went out and things like that. Well, during those three years that I did it, uh, I, I, I'm telling you for a reason, I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, you know, I met a couple governors, and I, I met a then vice president, and this and that. I don't, I don't tell you for, I don't tell you the, uh, the <laughs> believe me. When people ask me, I'm not going to say the person's name because I don't want my video taken down. <laughs> you know, that, uh, when people ask me who's the most famous person you ever met, I have to say that person's name. But it wasn't a highlight for me. I'll just say that. It, <laughs> it might be the most famous person, but it wasn't a highlight for me. The reason I'm telling you all this, you know, is they had to make sure all the security was right. They had to do all these things. And I met all these people and this and that. There's a... Just as with King Herod, that person, some of those people that I met, they might have had power and authority, just like King Herod. But as I see it, it wasn't none of them wise. It wasn't none of them wise men. You see, it's more important to be a wise man than an important person. Amen. It's more important to be wise than to have a title. It's more important to be a godly person, have godly wisdom, than being an important person. You see, because none of that's going to matter when you cross over to the other side. Not one of those things is going to matter. King Herod had the title of the king of Jews. That's the title he wanted. I'm sure a lot of politicians have run for office simply because of the title and the prestige that goes with it and all the power and authority. They don't realize it all can be taken from them in a day. And when you cross over to the other side, none of those things will matter. King Herod wanted that title, King of the Jews. But he really had no right to it. You see, that's why King Herod was so upset when they were saying, the King of the Jews has come. He thought, well, there's only one king. Well, he was right, but it wasn't him. It wasn't him. The King of the Jews was Jesus Christ. There's a contrast between King Herod and Jesus that vastly separates them. Herod was the king of pride. Jesus was the king of humility. Herod built palaces for himself, yet Jesus was born in a manger. Herod took people's lives. Jesus gives life. 
See, there's a vast difference. You may not have the power and authority, and nobody may ever know your name in this world. But the only thing that's going to matter again the days is that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is the only thing that's going to matter. The rest of this, you're going to leave here. What stands out to me about the wise men is this. They didn't have a mindset of, oh, it's the thought that counts. What they did was give their best. Many times we say that, oh, it's the thought that counts is, we didn't really put the effort into it that we should have. We didn't really give our best, so we try to make an excuse. It's the thought that counts. When you give your best to God, you know what? I believe God notices. God notices things like that when you actually give your best. That gets God's attention. Not all this other stuff. Sometimes when we go in this world, like some of the people that I just mentioned, and we think we're something, I bet God thinks we're something too. <laughs> Can you imagine? I bet God thinks we're something too. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me ask you this. I called this sermon series Wind of Change. Maybe there's some, there's some change that needs to take place in your life as well. You may be born again, but maybe there's, there's some changes that need to take place in your life as well.